Are you listening? Damn. Uh. Yeah. And welcome into another episode of the Damn Podcast here on the 24-7 Sports Network and powered by beaverblitz.com. I am joined, as always, by beaverblitz.com publisher Angie Machado. Angie, how are you doing on this Sunday, less than two weeks away from fall camp? I am. Or, I'm, sorry, from, from the season from, opener. Yeah, not even fall camp, from the season opener. I am so good. I'm so excited for football. Um, I was I hosted a couple open houses today. So it was kind of fun. Talked a little football with some of the clients and I'm ready to go. Let's talk football. I know we are, uh, we are previewing Oregon state's offense. Angie, I want to check real quick. Can you hear me all right? Cause my audio is uh, questionable. Yes. I hear you loud and clear. All right. No worries then. Uh, just got to check the, uh, check the microphone, but uh, yeah. So Angie, Sorry for the the chaotic intro here. I was I was questioning myself because I couldn't hear myself in in my earbuds. But um, we are talking Oregon State's offense right now as we uh, as we start to kind of preview the season. I mentioned we're less than two weeks away from Oregon State season opener, but the college football season is starting this week. This is week zero, so you'll get you know those teams that play overseas, the ones that play against Hawaii, um, all of that good stuff. Those guys will start on. Saturday, I believe, is the first game. Uh, but Oregon State, September 3rd against Boise State in Corvallis. So we are all, it's everything we're doing right now is leading up to that. So today's show is focusing on the offense, what we have seen throughout fall camp, what we expect throughout the season. We'll be back Thursday to preview the defense. And then a week from today, we're going to go game by game, give our predictions for Oregon State's football season. And at that point, it'll be game week. So we really are right around the corner, Angie. It's uh, it feels like it has come so quickly, but I am like, I am ready to go. I am ready I, for this season. I am ready too. I know this has been kind of a fast and furious off season, and it seems like yesterday, literally, that we were going down to Corvallis uh, for the first day of fall camp. So um, I'm glad that we are here. Let's talk some offense. And actually, I love the new intro. I love. Maybe we should we should talk about that a little bit because I know you've been doing a ton of stuff behind the scenes, Carter. With the new pot, with the podcast's new um, platform with twenty four seven sports, what, why don't you give us a quick recap there so everyone knows where to find us? Yeah, so that's the trick right now is we just need to make sure that everybody who's listening to us on YouTube, who also uh, you know listens to the audio version, um, if you're listening to the audio version right now, clearly you've done something right because we have switched over to a new feed uh, on on our end, you know, the, the back end here, the technical side. Since we joined the 24-7 Sports Podcast Network, we had to, you know, reconfigure some stuff. Uh, so again, if you're listening to us on the audio side right now, you've done something right because you found us. Uh, but if you're watching us on YouTube or you know somebody who is struggling to find the show, it is still under Damn Podcast, but you're going to have to resubscribe to it on Spotify, Apple, uh, Stitcher, iHeart, wherever you listen to it, you'll have to resubscribe to the new show to get all of the new episodes. The old one should be gone from all of the platforms, uh, but if it's still for some reason up there, just make sure you've got the new one. So the new one's got the 24-7 sports logo on it. It's got the, you know, the logs like you see uh, on the banner here if you're watching us live on YouTube. Shout out to the handful of people who are listening to us on, on YouTube. Our numbers continue to go through the roof on that platform. It's awesome to have you guys join us. And we love uh, that you leave comments and questions for us. And we hope that you'll do the same today so that we can kind of add on to the stuff that we've got lined up. Uh, but well, Angie, Carter, if, if you've Carter, got anything we, else to add oh, before we jump in, go for yeah, it. Yeah, I just, I mean, we have done a ton of stuff in the off season here. Um, not only changing up the, the t podcast, and this is your baby. I am so proud of you because this is has grown so much just in the past maybe two months. Um, but we also have a TikTok channel now. So we brought on a couple guys, um, Race Rogers and Ben Reed, who are kind of taking over some social for us. Um, they created a TikTok account. So you'll see some of their um, hype videos and some of their feature little short clip videos um, on the Beaver Blitz at TikTok, Beaver Blitz at Instagram, and then the Beaver Blitz um, 
Twitter account as well. So a little bit different stuff there as well. And um, yeah, just excited to kind of grow the brand, continue to uh, move forward as we try to reach as many Beaver fans as, oh, how could I forget either? One of my favorite things is our Wednesday night chats back on Twitter spaces. So um, seven to eight Wednesday night, join us on Twitter spaces for um, just some Beaver football talk. So we've got an all out Beaver Blitz attack on social media right yeah. now, hitting all the channels. Uh, YouTube, of course, if you know if you're watching us or if you've checked out any of the videos uh, that we posted right throughout fall camp, make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel uh, because throughout the season, we're going to continue to post content there. That's where you can find the live broadcast of the damn podcast. It's where you can find midweek interviews, uh, you know, Jonathan Smith, press conference, all of that good stuff. Uh, we actually introduced some instant analysis videos throughout fall camp. So hopefully, uh, all of you guys were checking those out as well. It was really fun to put together some B-roll from practice and, you know, talk about what we saw uh, from the comfort of our air-conditioned cars for the most part. Uh, but that was, uh, it's, it's been a fun kind of expansion project that uh, that we've taken on. So um, hitting all of the, the social media channels, you can find us pretty much everywhere right now, which is exciting ahead of the football season because yeah. our content is, is going to go through the roof. Where, wherever you're at, you know, if you're, if you're a Twitter person, make sure you're following Carter, myself, Beaver Blitz, make sure you are following. If you're on Instagram, like I said, that has been a little dead lately, but I promise we're going to have some new stuff. Um, the guys just released a new, uh, top five players. So they went with a tie for number five and Alton Julian is featured this afternoon. So there's a quick little video there. So if you, if you're onto that, check that too. And I don't know, Carter, I think we might have to do some instant analysis after games too. It might be kind of fun. I think we probably will. It's just a matter of finding time to do everything, but I think, I think we've got a good plan for the season. I think people are going to enjoy it. But today, again, we're just focusing on the offense. So yes. I'll give you a little rundown of what we're going to do here. We're going to hit on some of the key storylines that have emerged from camp and that have um, kind of continued to linger throughout the offseason. We're going to hand out some preseason awards. So, you know, our, our MVP of, of camp and whatnot, uh, who we expect to be the most improved, all of those kinds of things. Then we're going to go position by, position by position like we did after the first week of fall camp. Uh, just kind of update you on you know, some of these position battles, who's emerged, um, some more position-specific storylines there. And then we'll wrap things up with some general predictions of, of how we see the season going for the Oregon State offense. So where we stand right now... We are we're here recording on Sunday, August twenty first. Fall camp started on, I believe, the third. Third. Uh, so we're you know about two and a half weeks into camp. We've seen two weeks worth of practice as well, thirteen, 13 or fourteen days, um, and we were actually locked out. Media has been um, shut out from practice as of last Thursday. So moving forward, they're fully in game prep. You know, season mode. Uh, want to keep things under wraps. So we expected it to come. We didn't necessarily okay. think it was going to be as soon as it happened. But uh, yeah, we are basically everything that we're rolling with between now and the season is just stuff that we've seen from camp. We're not going to really get too much new intel. Yeah, it, but, it, it did finish a little before I thought it would. But that maybe is a sign that the coaches see some special year ahead of them and don't want to give things away and can start you know, implementing more of the playbook early. Yeah, which is most likely what they're doing right now. They're actually, as we speak, I believe, um, I, I don't know exactly what time they made it up there, but today on Sunday, uh, they're actually going through a walkthrough at Providence Park in Portland, which is great because, you know, they're playing a game there yeah. this year. And uh, you would hope that they have an opportunity to kind of get familiar with the, with the facility and, facility and everything. I know Jonathan Smith said yesterday after the second scrimmage of camp, they were just going to go up there and, and, you know, kind of throw the ball around, kick it a little bit, just kind of get a feel for the place. But they weren't necessarily going to break a sweat, you know, practice too too hard and anything. Um, you know, specifically the day after a scrimmage, you know, it's going to be a light practice anyways. Uh, but that's what they're doing today. They'll continue to, to kind of ramp up to game week. They've got a couple more practices before they move on from the camp mode. Uh, and they'll kind of start to lock down, you know, they're they're too deep and, and focus on game prep from there. So really the the middle of this upcoming week, they'll be fully transitioning over to Boise State mode, which is exciting because you know, like we were just saying, 
this has really crept up on us in these next two weeks. These might be the two longest weeks of the off season because we're like, we're dialed in, we're, we're ready for the season. Um, but everything has just gone so quickly. So Angie, I, I know you're excited as, as I am. Uh, why don't you hit us with a couple of the key storylines that we have seen emerge throughout camp and, and some of the things that you and I have kept our eyes on. Over yeah. The last you know, month. I, I think the the number one thing is this might, you know, for, for the past five to 10 years, I would say that there were more question marks on defense than there was offense. And this might be the first year that I have more questions on the offensive side of the ball. Defense looks to be the strength of this year's team um, offense. I, while I don't necessarily think there's huge red flags, I think there are more questions, questions about it. So um that's that's something new, and I think that you and I both maybe have agreed on some of that. I think the questions at wide receiver have have kind of been there. Um, quarterback, um, I, I don't necessarily think there's a, a battle for QB one. And yes, I'm a journalist that uses the term QB one. I think it's okay, um, but for those I, who uh, for for those who don't get the reference, depending on where you get your Oregon State news from on Twitter, you may have seen something about that this morning. So. Yeah, somebody doesn't like being like it called QB one and. I, I think with social media, that's that's where I use it the most. But um, I just want, I, I think, I don't know, maybe you disagree, but I think it's Chance Nolan's job. Um, I don't really know why the the big, you know, mystery of we haven't named a starter yet. But um, I think from everything we've seen, I think this is Chance Nolan's job to lose. And um, so then it's a matter of, of who's the backup. is. Does Ben Goldbranson get that nod at backup or is that Tristan Jebbia's job? So um, that will be, you know, kind of, something we're watching as well. Yeah, I think that's, you know, most seasons we enter this time of year and that's where the fans focus is, you know, who's going to take that starting quarterback job, who's going to, you know, shake out at, at the key positions, the skill positions, uh, you know, who's filling that starting lineup. So we're going to touch on that when we go position by position here, but definitely I wanted to highlight, you know, where this quarterback competition in air quotes stands right now. Angie and I both see it being Chance Nolan's job. Uh, Jonathan Smith has has practically said as much by you know running him out there with the ones and and not really giving any other guys opportunities with the first team in camp. Um, so unless it's a big smoke screen, and now that they've closed the doors, now it's like Ben Goldbranson or Don Montiel is like. Hey, I mean that's <laughs> that's essentially how it worked last year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, uh, so that's that's the situation at quarterback. Uh, we definitely want to highlight the the running back room as well. Just the fact that there are four guys in there that I think have the talent and the potential and the ability to start on this team. Uh, it, it creates a really interesting scenario where you have to find enough carries to go around for you know three four guys. Uh, we'll touch on that a little bit. And then Angie also mentioned the questions that the two of us have at the receiver position. I think what we've seen in camp has been uh, strikingly positive from some of the younger players. It's just a matter of, you know, can they beat out or produce at a higher level or at a consistent level or at the same level as some of the guys who have been in that room in that two deep for the last couple of years. Uh, those those three position groups in particular, I think, stand out as the ones that generate the most hype, have the most questions, um, are you know going to get the most headlines throughout the season. Unless there's anything else you want to add there, Angie, I think those three storylines are, are the ones we want to highlight and we'll definitely go further into uh, in the position by position section. No, I think that's great. In that case, we are going to hand out some preseason awards. So. I, I don't think, you know, this pod is, is going to go with a full hour like we have in the past. We're going to keep this light, uh, just focus on, you know, the the two sides of the ball over the next couple of days. But this preseason awards section, I think I want to hide. I, I think we should come back to this at the end of the year and, and just see how things develop. See how right or wrong we were. Yeah. And so, you know, when I was writing out the the list of what we want to touch on here in this podcast, I, I wrote out preseason awards, but I didn't specify, you know, are we predicting who our MVP is going to be by the end of the season? Who has it been this off season? And I did that on purpose because okay. I think I want to give us some leeway here as, as far as, you know, which direction we take this. So Angie, let's start with you, your MVP, either from camp, the first two weeks that we saw, or from the off season in particular, or who you're projecting 
this season. I'll let you kind of guide the ship here with your MVP pick. That's hard because I mean, so I like, I like picking who I, my off season slash fall camp is a little better because I have a better handle on that than trying to predict. I mean, at the end of the day, I really hope Chance Nolan is is who who we're talking about, or Damian Martinez, because you guys know how high I am on Damian Martinez, but um, or any of those those running backs. But I'm actually going to go. I I will be take the easy way out here, and I will say that my MVP from summer on off season would be Silas Bolden. From cool. what we've seen, um, you know his development, and goodness, it would be awesome if I could say you know in December or J- January fifteenth that you know. Silas Bolden was the MVP of the season too, because, um, you know, losing Trevon Bradford, you know, we talked about receivers a little bit and Oregon state hasn't had any guy that really has just been eye popping, but they've had, they found a guy every year that can kind of just get the job done. And and they lost Trevon um, who was kind of that stalwart there for a while. So they're really going to need a guy that can, that can come down with the ball and, and make the plays. And what we saw from Silas is off season offensively. I thought was, was big, but then I will give the caveat that I really hope that we can say that, you know, a, a chance Nolan or, you know, somebody really stepped up, but how's that right. for some kind of weaving some both, both parts in. Yeah, I like it. I think, I think I'm going to approach this from just the, the fall camp perspective, okay. the off season perspective. And then, you know, at the end of the season, we can talk about our, our in season stuff, but I'm glad that you actually mentioned Trevon Bradford because I, I didn't throw in the rundown a section to talk about the NFL guys, but I, I think we should take a quick aside here to talk about the fact that Trevon Bradford got some playing time yesterday with the chargers, uh, had a nice reception. It went for man, 15, 20 yards or so. So good to see him out there making plays at the next level in the preseason. Tegan Quatoriano with Houston yeah, had a, had touch a touchdown down. catch on a, kind of a rollout dump down. And then, you know, he goes five to seven yards into the end zone, which we saw that play a ton at Oregon State. So cool to see that they're using him in a similar fashion in Houston. Uh, BJ Baylor was actually cut by the Packers, but he had a nice play as well in one of their preseason games. And I feel like I'm I'm leaving guys out here, but oh, Isaiah Hodgins comes to mind. He had a, a couple of catches in Buffalo. So those guys that that Oregon State has produced the last the last couple of years, starting to make plays in the NFL. It's it's exciting to see. You know, it's just preseason, uh, but hopefully some of those guys are doing enough to make a regular season roster. But back to our focus of the day, and back to our preseason awards. My MVP from camp. You say you took the easy way out with Silas Bolden, but I think I'm going to take the easier way out and go with an offensive lineman. It's oh, really tough. Come on. It's really tough for us to judge the offensive line performance in camp, but I've seen enough through two weeks to know that that group's going to be okay, and particularly on the left side of the line. So I'm going to go with Joshua Gray because any concerns that I've had with the offensive line throughout camp have all stemmed from the right side. There have been a couple of false start penalties on that side. Uh, when we're seeing guys get into the pocket defensively, a lot of that comes from that side of the line. But not once have I said, oh man, Josh Gray got beat there. Or Josh Gray was you know, responsible for a penalty. Not once has his name come up. He's probably the only player that I didn't write down in, in my notebook okay. all camp. And I think that's a really, really good sign because we shouldn't be focusing on offensive yeah, linemen yeah. in camp that we shouldn't, you know, have those guys in our notes. Uh, they shouldn't be the ones out there making plays. And if they are, it's probably a bad thing. So good call. The fact that Josh Gray hasn't come up in my mind means he's going to be really solid this year. Uh, and and somebody who I, I think you and I both picked him in our preseason top three or whatever, when we did our, our top players countdown, um, good to see him in, in camp. You know, he, he looks, he's huge for one. He looks very comfortable on the left side of the line. Uh, I think it's an NFL tryout year for him. And, um, just the fact that he was so rock solid in camp, I, I think is a great sign. So I took the easy way out there, Angie. I, I, I think your most improved pick is going to be telling, or it's going to be interesting to me because yeah, yeah. Silas Bolden probably been, fits yeah. in there. So my most improved is I'm actually kind of going kind of your route is I'm going with Jake Levengood. I'm, I'm sticking with okay. the offensive line because we just didn't see a ton from him. We saw little bits and pieces, um, but he's filling in for Nate Eldridge who, you know, really was kind of the stalwart center. And 
how the offensive line goes is kind of how the season goes for Oregon State. And so to have a guy that really, I mean, like you said, Josh Gray, absolutely solid pick for MVP. I could, I mean, you could say Brandon Kipper as well. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go with most improved is Levin Good because that is such a huge position, the center. And really, it's it's been pretty seamless. Solid pick, and he stayed healthy throughout camp, which was obviously his one drawback last year was, you know, he was battling uh, injuries and I think missed close to half the season um, mm-hmm. as far as, you know, whether, whether it was full games or part of games. I think he was in and out for about six or seven of those. Um, so good to see him stay on the field. And uh, again, you know, another one of those guys where we're not necessarily picking them out when we're watching practice, which I think is is very telling of somebody who's primed for a big year. My improved pick, I I just mentioned it. I'm going with Silas Bolden here. Just somebody who, at this point last year, was nowhere on either of our radars. Mm -hmm. And throughout the season, really, I mean, he didn't even see the field. So I think the fact that Silas Bolden has come on this offseason a little bit in spring camp, but mostly in fall camp, as a guy, you know, somebody who can who can play with the starting group and who has been making plays on the regular is somebody who is in our notebooks every day, responsible for the big plays throughout or through the, uh, through the passing game. He has stood out to me as one of the best players on this offense in camp. And I mean, you confirm that with your MVP Mm -hmm. pick, I'm slotting him in my most improved just because that came out of nowhere. Yeah, no, I, when you, when, when you said, I was like, ah, I shot. anyway, it all works out because I agree. I think we weren't talking about him at all. Yeah. Two touchdowns in the spring game back in April and then throughout fall camp uh, was consistently the, uh, probably the, the number one receiver as far as volume, touchdowns, yardage, speed. And that, you, you, you hit on it right there consistently. And that, yeah. that is the one thing I think this group has lacked is consistency. And this is a, a guy that every single day we watch practice, he, was consistently giving it his all. He never took plays off, and he came down with hard catches, easy catches, just consistent. Just a guy who I think Oregon State fans are going to be really surprised by, somebody who I think is going to be uh, one of the the top playmakers on this team, and and people throughout the conference are going to have no idea where it came from. Uh, Frankly, in camp, we didn't really know where it came from either. Just somebody who has made a huge leap early on in their career, you know, some of those young guys need a year or two in the system to get really comfortable. He always had the potential to do this with his athleticism, some of the physical tools that he brings to the fold. Uh, but to see him actually capitalize on it and become, I think, a, a guy who we both predict to have a pretty big year in this offense, uh, that that says a lot about what he's done since arriving on campus. We're moving on to the best position group award. And Angie, again, I'm going to let you go first. Here. See, this is hard because it can go one of two ways. And I'll say running back or O-line. Yep. Um, so, I, okay, you pick one and I'll take okay. the other. Okay, so I mean, I'm going to go with O-line because as I said earlier, okay. as the O-line goes is how this Beaver offense goes. So they need to be the best. But and that's it, how it worked last it's, year. It's a toss-up. It is a toss-up because that running back room is is stacked. Yeah, we could talk, you know, on and on about this offensive line. And we have for the last year just because it was so good last year and appears to be maybe not quite as dominant, but still very, very strong and and one of the potentially best groups on the West Coast. But the running back room, the fact that we're talking about that group in the same breath as a group that I think was one of the five best in the country last year stems mostly just from the depth at that position. So Oregon State, as I said earlier in the show, has four guys that I see as potential starters. Damien Martinez, Trey Lowe, Deshaun Fenwick, and Jam Griffin, not necessarily in that order. I have no idea what the order is going to be. When we get the two deep, the the depth chart that they release the Monday of game week, I have no idea what it's going to look like. It's, gonna it's have probably going to be a bunch of oars. <laughs> Um, but those four, those four guys are going to see playing time and I think all have the potential to do really good things with the football. And the fact that you have four guys who are capable of seeing the field and producing at a high level, very, very, very few teams have that. Yeah. A lot of teams will have two, maybe three. I mean, look at Arizona State the last couple of years with uh, Chip Trayanum and 
uh, Rashad White. Both of those guys were very, very high level contributors, but there were only two of them. And I think Oregon State has three or four. So that makes this, in my in in my opinion, one of the deepest groups on the roster, if not the deepest, even though it might not necessarily have the top high end talent. So what's going to be interesting is to see how AJ Stewart handles this room because think yeah. about it i mean and this is an oregon state group that lost its leading rusher from a year ago in bj baylor and we're still talking about them as one of the best units on the offense um but you know they they had to replace jamar jefferson and then they do so with bj baylor do you think this is going to be a group that we see another like one guy really just come out and grab grab the bull by the horns and, and take over or do you think this is really going to be four guys that have equally shared um shared time and carries <laughs> It probably won't be completely equal, but I also don't think that there's one guy right now that stands out as, you know, even necessarily having the potential to do it. So you don't um, think my early last spring prediction that by the by the end of the season that Damian Martinez will be the leading rusher is? Well, it's, it, I mean, it's certainly still possible. It's just the fact is Trey Lowe brings so much to the fold as a receiver and Deshaun Fenwick with his power rushing ability and, and Jam Griffin with his breakaway speed that, I don't know how you can commit to one guy giving them enough carries. Damian Martinez could certainly be the leading rusher, but it might only be with 600 or 700 yards just because <laughs> there are only so many carries to go around. See, that's, I, that brings up a good point because you could, I could have made an easy argument that Trey Lowe was the most improved too. See, I don't, totally see, could. just one, one thing leads to another here on the, on the damn podcast. Okay. I will ask you this one. Yep. I, who is your pick for um, best coach? MVP coach. So this is our final preseason award for the offensive side of the ball. And preseason coach of the year is tough because we're, you know, we're kind of basing it off of last year's performance projection for this year, a little bit of recruiting ability in the off season, I suppose. Um, but there are, there's actually multiple guys on this side of the ball. And I think one of them is obvious and it's Jim Mahalachek. So I'm going to take him no! or mine. Sorry, <laughs> that puts you in a tough position, I know. Um, but yeah, Jim Mahalachuk, what he did last year, turning Oregon State's offensive line group into one of the best in the country, developing the talent that he inherited while also building up some of his own guys, I think was commendable. And what he's shown recently, obviously, you know, the, the coaches can't talk about the, the commits who haven't signed yet, but some of the guys that Oregon State has gotten to commit and, and recently yeah. sign Oregon State's bringing in talent at the offensive line position like it hasn't in a long time. There are a lot of really high-end offensive linemen, high three-star guys who are committing and signing to the program. And so I think the recruiting side is where Maholchuk has has made his biggest leap, but his greatest strength and the consistency that he shows, uh, what he brings to the mix, what he brings to this coaching staff, is his ability to develop talent and I, I think versatility on the offensive line depth as well comes to mind. Um, really, you, you put all of that together and, and you have the whole package there. And I think that's why Jim Mahalachek is so highly regarded as one of the best position groups, one of the best position coaches in college football. And and so I, it's, I can't argue with that. I do, I do want to, I see a comment over here from Justin F., um, he was. He said that we should have picked Bray. This is an offense only. We are just highlighting offense today. Thursday, we will be talking defense. So come back on Thursday. We'll be talking, giving the defense their love. Okay, so offensive coach, I, I would have to have Jim Mahalachek at my number one. Easy, easy, easy. Um, that is, you you gave all the, the right reasons. Um, but just I'm not going to make you pick somebody yeah, if you I mean, want to, because I, 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 I think, think he really is just I head and shoulders is. above the I, rest. Um, I I do want to give a shout out since we are talking a little recruiting to um, Wozniak, the tight end yeah. coach, um, because I think what he's doing recruiting wise and development wise is also super important, but I, I can't argue. I think Jim Mahalachek is, he is that coach that you keep at all costs that coach Smith has to keep no matter what. There are, I think across the staff. And again, you mentioned, we'll talk about the defensive side. I think there are a couple of guys on this staff I, I, that are, really can't. really important that you cannot let leave yeah um and and Mahalachuk certainly fits the bill there we're going to take a quick break but when we come back we're going to go position by position across the oregon state football offense and then we'll give some general predictions at the end you're listening to the damn podcast powered by beaverblitz.com the 24 7 sports podcast network 
BeaverBlitz.com is proud to be the leader in Oregon State football and men's basketball recruiting coverage. With access to the most talented and well-connected recruiting analysts in the nation, we're your source for all the latest scholarship offer, official visit, and transfer portal news. Year-round coverage of Oregon State football, men's basketball, baseball, and everything else within the athletic department makes BeaverBlitz.com the all-inclusive destination for in-depth analysis of all things Beaver sports. Join us today with a monthly or annual subscription to gain full access to our VIP articles, team of experts, and message board. Membership also grants the ability to chat with fellow Beaver fans and gain behind-the-scenes intel in the Lodge. You'll get all this and more, including access to all of the team sites across the 24-7 Sports Network with your subscription. So join today to keep up on your favorite teams and your rivals, too. All right, we're going position by position here on the Oregon State offense. And... I know we have talked, you know, kind of in depth about some of these groups already, but we're going to go even further and provide maybe some predictions here, uh, how we see things shaping out, exactly what we've seen in practice, some of the highlight plays, that kind of stuff. That's what we're going to do here. And we're, we're starting with the quarterback. So Chance Nolan, I think Angie, both of us agree, he's the starting quarterback. He's going to be named the starting quarterback as soon as this Friday when we talk with Jonathan Smith at the very latest by next Monday. Tell me why that is. Why, why has he separated himself or, or why has he prevented uh, anyone else from, from kind of jumping into that top tier on the depth chart? He just has comfort in the offense. You know, we watch him, he has comfort with the receivers. Um, He knows the system inside and out. I mean, he started last season um, for the, for the team. Um, The team actually has a lot of confidence in, in him. So I think that's another, another, big huge part of the quarterback puzzle um he's been working on the deep ball you know that if you had one knock on chance nolan it would be his his ability for those deep balls and and catching guys in stride so i i wouldn't say he has nailed it but i would say that he looks a little improved i want to see him in game action because we haven't seen them go deep a lot in in practice that we have watched um i just i think i i like ben goldbranson's arm I think Ben gives that arm, but we've seen Ben throw too many interceptions. So he needs to cut back on the interceptions. And I just think that that chance gives you that mobility with his legs. He can, he can make plays happen. And like I said, when you have the locker room, you know, the support of the locker room, that's, you can't, you can't mess with that. And another guy who I I actually, I think all three guys have support of the locker room and Tristan does too which is what he brings to the table that the other guys don't is he's been a captain. He's been here longer. Um, you know, he's had time to build rapport with some of his teammates. I mean, shoot, he was Tyjon Lindsay's roommate at Nebraska like five years ago. So he has deeper connections than anybody else. But I think when we're talking about, uh, you know, tangible ability, downfield accuracy, running ability at this point in his, in his career, Chance Nolan brings a little bit more to the fray and Ben Goldbranson as a younger guy has a lot of what Tristan doesn't, which makes him, I think, more of an attractive option as the backup. So, do, which, so do you, if, if you were giving your two deep right now, would you have it be Chance and then Ben? Yeah, I, I would personally. And it really, I mean, it's not a knock against Tristan because no. he has led Oregon State to wins. He has been the starting quarterback on this team and he's come in in, in situations and has played very well. Yeah. But just the fact that, you know, he's still coming off of an injury that, you know, potentially limits his ability as a runner. Um, The fact that he hasn't played in so long and and has so far removed from that playing experience and doesn't have the upside as Chance Nolan's legs or Ben Goldbranson's arm brings. I think he's just, unfortunately, you know, he's just kind of the odd man out okay. because of what those other guys skill-wise bring to the fold. But okay, then I'm going to give you a hypothetical here because I'm just curious because I don't disagree with you. But let's say it is the last two minutes against Oregon. The Beavs are down by four and you have two minutes, two minute drill. Who and neither, it's, it's been Chance Nolan the whole year and now all of a sudden Chance goes down. Who do you bring in? It's tough. I mean... That that really is a toss up, actually. <laughs> I think about it because no. so let's go back to the 2020 season. Ben Branson basically ran a two minute drill against Arizona yeah. State that final drive of the year. Uh, it ended in a touchdown on the final play, what turned out to be the final play of the regular season in all of college football because that was such a late game. I think it was an 8 p.m. kickoff. Um, 
he's already done it in a game against a Pac-12 team. And I know very, very small sample size, but he did that as a freshman, and I don't think he's gotten worse. Tristan, of course, was a very big reason why Oregon State won a couple of games that year as well. Um, of course, he was very clutch as well late in the game against Oregon before he got hurt, led that drive all the way down to the goal line. So I think both guys really bring uh, the intangibles there, you know, the the leadership qualities. But again, if you're going to Ben Goldbranson's ability, his upside with his arm, I, depends. I guess it depends on where the ball is. If it's at the 35 and you need somebody to throw a deep ball and, and pick up some chunk yardage, I think you have to go with Ben just because... Yeah. frankly he has a better ability to do that i just that's a good question i listeners i'd love to hear your thoughts on it what would you do in that situation but um i i think like you said oregon state has three guys for sure that they can win with three guys who they can win with and and that's the reason that jonathan smith has kept this a competition i i think um partially also the whole transfer thing i mean you, we've seen it across the country guys find out that they're not going to be on the two deep or they're not going to be the starter and they transfer. And so I think partially, you know, Jonathan wants to keep that core intact and, and keep guys on campus as long as possible. Um, I, I don't know. I, I was surprised that he didn't name chance the starter earlier, but I guess if we're following the pattern that Jonathan has uh, the precedent that he has set, it shouldn't come as too much of a surprise. We're going to move to the running back group here. So we've already previewed the just the, the log jam. I think that they have at the top of the depth chart right now with four guys. That's again Deshaun Fenwick, Trey Lowe, Damian Martinez, and Jam Griffin. From what we saw in camp, I mean, not only is there not one guy who stands out from the rest, but I think everybody took just about equal reps with the first mm -hmm. and second teams. Um, if, if you want to go even further down the depth chart, I mean, Kanoa Shannon, a, a walk on who actually saw some playing time in the bowl game, uh, got some reps with the second team, which he has consistently done throughout his career in spring and fall camps. I don't know that he's necessarily going to figure into the picture here as much as these four guys. Uh, but just the fact that, you know, so many guys have, have gotten equal looks with the ones and twos, I think is very telling of where this group is right now. Yeah, I agree. I, like I said, I, we have not seen a running back room this deep and Duke's making an appearance on the damn podcast. This is, this is the dog Duke. Um, at least he's not barking Carter. So that's, that, that is a positive. Fingers um, crossed on that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I agree. I think this is such a fun group. I, I love what each of them brings too. They all bring something a little different. So I think it's a fun, fun group. And seriously, when was the last time you saw Oregon State's running back room that deep? Yeah, it's been, I'd say it's a long time, but I, I mean, I don't know that I've ever seen it four deep. No, no. Uh, usually there are two or three guys who are very capable runners. I, I think to Ortavis Pierce and Jamar Jefferson being there at the same time. I mean, you can go even, you can go way back. Ryan McCants and, and Jaquiz Rogers. I mean, it seems like every year there's at least one or two guys. And you forgot Clinton Polk who had to run it against USC that year. Very true. So, I mean, it's, I think, you know, we can call Oregon State running back you and whatnot. Um, the the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. Oregon State year after year has produced high level talent. And I don't think that's going to be any different this year, even though you might not see some of the eye popping numbers that Jamar posted as a freshman or that Jaquiz posted throughout his career, just because I think they're going to be sharing the ball uh, so much more than those guys had to. Angie touched on the fact that they all bring something different to the offense. And I think we should highlight that here because the fans haven't really gotten a chance to see Jam Griffin or Damian Martinez because they haven't played in a regular season game at Oregon state yet. So let's just kind of highlight what we see these guys bringing. So if I was going down the list, I would have Deshaun Fenwick as a power rusher, yeah. Trey Lowe as kind of an all purpose uh, receiver with really good speed out of the backfield. Uh, Damian Martinez as kind of a hybrid of the two. I think he's really strong at the point of attack, but has really sneaky speed. And then uh, Jam Griffin as as a, an elusive kind of, oh, I'm going to sneak through the blocks and get into the second level with my speed type of guy. Is, is that kind of your read on yeah. what they bring? Yeah, and I would say Damian Martinez, what I like from him is he's one cut and gone. Yeah, um, We saw several times where he made it through the – the line and it was one cut and nobody caught him. Yeah. There's no shifting around. It's no, not a downhill you know, run. 
there's no bully ball at the yeah. at the point of attack. It's just no, we're going. Uh, Jam Griffin, I want to highlight too. He actually had, you know, he he was a little bit limited throughout camp. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if he was fully healthy in the kind of the the second week or whatnot. Um, but he came back late, uh, mid last week, and had a twenty yard run uh, in practice where he broke a tackle at the line of scrimmage and then just plowed through a guy like 10 yards downfield and then ran for another 10 yards down towards the goal line. So I think that combination of power and speed makes him really interesting. It's just, I mean, they all bring that. So yeah, it's yeah. interesting to, it'll be really interesting to see how Oregon state uses a guy like Jan Griffin, who I think if we were picking a list would probably be fourth, but really is, is good enough to be a, a first or second string guy on this team. I mean, he was a pretty good rusher at Georgia Tech, which is a run he- run heavy offense. And so cracking the two deep there is uh, it's it's no easy feat. Yeah. Yeah. And then don't forget the fullback. The what what Jack Hammer. What did I, I forget what Trevor called him last week? Uh Hack, Hack rack, Jammer. Rack Rack Maletto or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um we we're not going to go too deep into Jack Coletto just because I don't know what position to even yeah, put him <laughs> at. We'll probably touch on him at, at linebacker on Thursday when we do our defensive preview. Uh, but I do think we see a, quite a bit of the Coletto package this year. And and yeah. I don't necessarily know what position he's going to be playing because he's already played so many positions on the offense. He was you know doing some fullback work last year and um, obviously caught a touchdown pass. So I don't know where he's going to line up, but I do know that we're going to see a ton of him in short yardage situations. And I mean, probably more than that at this point, I, I yeah. just think the guy is, is such a unicorn when it comes to football ability that there's no way you can keep him off yeah. the field. Should we, should we move into the wide receivers? Yeah. We got to touch on receiver here. We're actually, uh, we're on pace for a full show. I know. I know. I wasn't seriously. expecting when I was putting this together, but uh, we're about halfway through our position by position look here at the offense. So let's talk wide receiver. When I look at the depth chart that I have in my mind and that I'm going to post here throughout the week at beaverblitz.com, uh, you know, some of our predictions for how we see it shaking out when we get it on Monday, uh, a week from tomorrow, as we're recording on the 21st. I have Trayshawn Harrison, Tajon Lindsay, and Anthony Gould at the top, but I think that Silas Bolden could crack that group. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and if not, if not, he'll be playing a lot in, in that group. Um, I, I think that's a solid list. I think I think we need to see we need to see Tajon. I mean, he flat out said he needs to step up. This is it. I think Trayshawn. We started to see glimpses of him. He flashed every once in a while last season. So. It's time to see that next step from him. Anthony Gould was one. I mean, if you guys were on Blitz last year, you know how frustrated I was in the lodge during games, during our, our in-game chat, that he wasn't seeing more more touches there. So, um, but Bolden. And then, I mean, we saw it looked like Re- – um, I said almost said Reggie Tongue. Micaiah Tongue um, had a touchdown yesterday in the scrimmage, so he's one to watch. Um, Jimmy Valson started to show flashes here late um, – Josiah Irish, another speedster. So there are other guys in the room to keep an eye out, but I think you're you're spot on with Harris and Lindsey Gould. Those three guys just have more experience than the others, and I don't necessarily know that. I mean, I don't even know that they have more talent than what mm-hmm. Silas Bolden brings to the fold right now, but they just have more experience, and I think that's why they get the nod for me. But I do think that Silas Bolden. Just the fact that he has ran with the ones a little bit in camp and has performed a little bit more than those guys, I could see him cracking that group and, and starting before long if if he doesn't start week one. Yeah, it, but, it's consistency. Like I said earlier, it's all going to be consistency um, and, and getting separation. That is the one thing that we haven't seen um, yeah. the past couple of years is is the separation. And you know we know that there's speed, um, but we need to see some separations and guys need to work on their hands and catching the ball. Yeah, because when they do get separation, it's not necessarily a guarantee that they're hauling it in. Yeah. Um, Harrison and Lindsay, in particular, are two guys who have struggled at times with drops throughout their career. I know that was the big knock on Harrison when he was at Florida State even, was that he flashed elite speed, but he couldn't haul in the passes. And obviously, as a receiver, you need to have that combination of both. Anthony Gould, I think, is a little more sure-handed as is Silas Bolden. Those are the two guys who have made the highlight reel catches in camp. Um, not necessarily that the other guys 
have struggled with drops, but I just don't think that we've seen I don't think that we've seen them consistently take a step yeah. forward there to where we're confident to say, oh yeah, that's not going to be a concern this year. Some of the younger guys that Angie kind of highlighted there, we, we actually have a question coming in from uh, Justin F about Jimmy Valson. says it seems like he's really come on. I would agree with that. I think within the last week of camp. It was week, yeah, because we didn't see much of him at all the first week. Yeah. Um, and just a couple couple flashes we saw um, the, the scrimmage a week ago and um, seen a, a little bit of him. His height, I think, is what is really interesting yeah. to me just because he has more size than most guys in this group. He's still very young, too. So just because he doesn't have a breakout year this year doesn't mean he, could, he can't pull a Silas Bolden and do it in camp yeah. next year and be one of those guys we're talking about as, oh, yeah, he's ready to make that leap. Yeah. But I do think he's going to see the field. Uh, and I do think John Dunmore as well is, is a guy who within, again, the last week of camp after that first week started to get some more reps with the ones and twos uh, and and became one of the favorite targets of Ben Goldbranson and Tristan Jebbia with the twos. I think at least one of those young guys has to step up in addition to Bolden for this group to reach a level where we're saying, oh yeah, this passing game yeah. is as good as it should be. You know, because... If if just those three, if Harrison, Lindsay, and Gould are the only three that are producing, I think we're going to have some serious concerns about depth because at wide receiver, we know that injuries are common. Injuries are going to happen. One of these guys is probably going to miss a game or two. So does Oregon State have enough guys behind them to step up and start? Bolden is one, but it's going to be key for Jimmy Vallison, John Dunmore, Micaiah Tung, Josiah Irish, one of those guys to emerge as someone who has starting level ability, starting level consistency, speed, um, you know, reliability with their hands. Because if there's an injury in this group, they are, they're totally unproven. Yeah, exactly. We're going to move to the tight end position. Another uh, kind of a, kind of a receiver focused group, but also that blocking ability, I think, adds a little wrinkle to this position that you're going to miss without Tegan Quatoriano in the room, who was one of the best blocking tight ends in the Pac-12 for four years. So Luke Musgrave, I have locked into the number one job in, in my book, and I think the coaches do too, has the potential to be a top three-ish tight end in this conference if, if he really puts it together. What he brought to Oregon State with him as a true freshman out of Bend High School Athletically, physically, potential-wise, he's somebody who we have touted for years. And I think this year now, he is somebody who you're looking to to step up and yeah. be one of the next guys on this team. Yeah, I mean, this is his year. I, I think he has all the potential in the world, and we're waiting for him to be the dude. Um, we saw toward the end of the season, um, I think that Oregon game was a huge breakout for him. Um, in that he was making the catches and, and wasn't suffering from the dropsies. But he needs to keep that up. He needs to um, be able to continue that and consistently catch the ball. I also like what we've seen from Jake Overman. Um, we've seen um, some of the younger guys in the mix. Um, so that's it's going to be an interesting room um, as far as you know who, who goes. Like I said, I, Overman, JT Byrne we've seen a lot of. We've seen a little bit of Gabe Milborn um, in that second group. Um, burn burns interesting. You know, I, I think he's grown a lot. He's, he's added some weight. Overman is added weight. It's a, it's a tight knit group, but like I said, Musgrave, this is his year. I mean, it's his year to, to take the reins and be the guy. Um, and I, I wanted to do that. The J factor one on YouTube asks who can get separation and compete for jump balls. And I think this came in while we were talking about the receivers, but I wanted to highlight it here because I think Luke Musgrave Musgraves is that the guy. guy. He is the guy. As far as just sheer strength, his height, he really does kind of fit the mold of one of those Stanford tight ends that torched Oregon State's defense through the, the Gary Anderson era and into the beginning of the Jonathan Smith era where you know Stanford was throwing for 400 yards a game, it seemed like, in those matchups. Um, I think Luke Musgrave kind of fits that mold. And if he reaches his potential, that's what he can bring to this offense. Yeah. He can bring a really reliable red zone target, but also somebody who has some sneaky speed and can make some big plays over the middle uh, earlier on in drives. So Musgrave, I think, is is going to be one of the keys to this passing game reaching its potential and, and frankly, not bottoming out. He is 
potential wise the top receiver on this team at the, and oh, you know, 100%. That's, I, I, you know, and I think that that trumps, you know, the receivers, even the wide yeah. receivers, I think from the tight end position, he can lead this team in catches um, like the, like the two guys at Utah have done the last year or two. Yep. So I, I completely... tapping into his potential and, and showing more consistency, I think is key, but also one of the things that I'm maybe not necessarily concerned about, but, but really hoping to see from this group is one of the younger guys, if not two, you mentioned a couple of them there. Yeah, yeah. Taking that next step and being a a one A one B kind of guy with Musgrave, or being a, a surefire backup, because for so long, you know, Oregon State had Noah Tongiai with Tegan Quatoriano and Quatoriano with Luke Musgrave, but right now it's it's just a group of younger guys who haven't actually produced yet. Um, pretty highly rated recruits, you know, solid uh, solid offer sheets, so. These guys are, are coming in with potential. Jack Velling is another one that I would yeah. throw into the mix. Um, Jonathan Smith actually mentioned that he made a couple of catches in the second scrimmage. He ran with the ones and twos throughout camp as well as a true freshman. So I think he can make a contribution. Oregon State has like four guys at the tight end position that I think it's comfortable putting on the field. It's just a matter of can they actually produce alongside Musgrave. And I think for the tight end group and and really the offense in general to to reach its potential, you're going to need to see one of those young guys step up and, you know, if if at the very least give Luke Musgrave a break every now and then. Exactly, exactly. But but so much potential. And like you said, that, you know, we, we said at the beginning that this offense has a lot of question marks. And these are some of the areas that if they're able to, you know, click on all cylinders, this could be the difference between an okay season and a really good season. I do think looking forward, the tight end group has the potential to be one of Oregon State's top yeah. groups on the roster. Just because of that young talent I mentioned, the fact that they have the, re- the uh, you know, the, the recruiting pedigree that mm-hmm. they do. Um, and I look to Jack Velling as a guy who, if he's not, competing for playing time this year which i mean i do think he is as a true freshman yeah he's going to be the next man up i think once Mm -hmm. musgrave leaves uh and oregon state has multiple guys coming in behind him so exciting future at that position it's just a matter of can they turn in results this year do you see do you think oregon state goes double tights like we've seen in the past Maybe not as often, but I, I mean, I don't know. I, I think they've got the guys there to do it if somebody emerges. So yeah, yeah if, if you see Jake Overman, you know, producing at a, at a pretty consistent level right away, then yeah, probably see some two tight end sets. But we got to move to the offensive line here because we're quickly running out of time. <laughs> um, we know what the starting group is going to be. There's, there's really no question about it. It's been the same group throughout camp. So Joshua Gray at left tackle, Marco Brewer at left guard. Jake Levengood moving to center this year, Brandon Kipper moving from the outside to right guard, and then Talia Safuaga making the jump up to the consistent starting group at right tackle. So that rounds out your offensive line. That's the group you're looking for uh, to continue to provide an edge in the trenches. Obviously, one of the keys to Oregon State's success last year was just dominating at the point of attack. And the fact that you know you bring three starters back and two guys that played a ton last year it really does give me hope that we're not going to see a drop off yeah I, I think this is this group i brandon kipper looks like he's put on some weight some good weight too to move inside and i mean he knows this offense J- joshua gray knows this offense um just the leadership there is, is huge we, we've talked about the o-line earlier in the show and um it's exciting i, I think this group could by the end of the year you know, if they can stay healthy be better than last year I'd say so too. Just, I mean, looking at the the top contributors here, Brandon Kipper has the potential to do what Nathan Eldridge did last year. You know, Joshua Gray is only going to be better than he was last year. Marco Brewer, statistically, you look at pro football focus and the grades they gave him, he was the best offensive lineman in the conference. So the potential Brandon certainly Kipper, is there. I just want Brandon Kipper to stay away from the false start. Maybe by moving him inside, referees won't see him false start. And that was something that I wanted to, to touch on with this group too, is I think that is the one area of concern right now. It's the pre-snap penalties. Holding calls, not really a concern as far as what we saw in camp, but there were some false starts and it has been mentioned by Jonathan Smith, Brian Lindgren, uh, as, as being one of the areas that they need to clean up before game one. In the scrimmage and, and in the most recent practices that we watched afterwards, 
there have been some referees on hand and there are a lot of flags thrown before the yeah. snap. So cleaning that up is going to be key. Outside of those five guys, I do think that there is some depth this year and newfound depth too. Because, you know, going into the spring, it was a concern. The coaching staff really wanted to address it. And I think they've identified guys who are ready to step up. So should anyone go down and, you know, on the offensive line, it happens. It happened last year with Jake Levengood. Uh, Tyler Moreno at the tackle spot, I think, is the next guy up. Mm-hmm. And then if anybody goes down on the interior part, uh, Hanelli Bloomfield, the, the former transfer out of Utah State, is the first man up. Uh, Campbell McHarg, actually, the, the transfer from Sacramento State, could be in that mix as well. But I think just the fact that you have at least one, if not two guys, Tommy Spencer comes to mind also, yeah. transferring over from the uh, from the tight end group. group. The fact that you've got one or two guys on the inside and outside that you feel pretty comfortable with, if anyone goes down, I mean, again, like I said earlier, you're, you probably won't see much of a drop off from that starting group. I agree. I, I think this, like I said, this this has a, this group has a has a potential to be better than last year if they stay healthy and, and like you said, the depth they have they have stronger depth this year than in the past. Another edge that they have too is they're going up against some stronger competition in practice. Obviously, yeah. last year. The defensive front was a major concern for Oregon State. I think it it cost them two games. I think it uh, it really limited their potential. It it lowered the ceiling and uh, ultimately was was the biggest weakness of that 2021 squad. Now it has become one of the strengths, if if not you know at, at least average. So the fact that the offensive line goes up against that every day in practice, um, you know the players at at every position really one of their their mantras this year has been iron sharpens iron and I I think that's very true on the offensive line you're seeing more competition in the trenches in practice which is only going to prepare them more for game day absolutely and 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 coach Bray has been mixing it up early and sending blitzes and and making those guys really start learning you know how to adjust and, and read defenses a lot quicker yep all right we have time for two quick predictions here before we get out okay this is uh, this is hot seat time, Angie. So I'm going to hit you with a uh, okay. with a question here. It's yes or no. Okay. Will the offense in 2022 score more points or fewer points per game than last year? I'm going to say fewer, but not by much. Because weren't they at like 32 last year? It was it was something like, like 31.6. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to say fewer, but slightly, like 30. That's what I've got too. I, I just think you know there are enough question marks on this offense to to make me think. Eh, I could see this going wrong or I could see that going wrong. You know, I could see the passing game not being as strong as it was last year. Um, I could see a step back at, at offensive line, even though we said it has the potential to be better, mm-hmm. you are still replacing starters. So, you know, what happens there? It has the potential to be as good of an offense as it, as it was last year, but I'm not going to go out and predict, you know, 35 points a game or anything like that right now. One more really quick before we get okay. out the strength okay. and the weakness of this group weakness is going to be the passing game okay strength is going to be the rush running game there you have it i'm gonna go weakness uh receiver depth and strength it's a tough one probably the running game uh just the combination of what you've got on the offensive line with the depth and ability at running back running back um, th- that running games, I-, I think, again, gonna be really potent. Uh, but like we said throughout the show, the uh, the the lack of depth or or proven depth at receiver scares me. That is pretty much it for the offensive side of the ball. I feel like we touched on just about everything. Uh, we went for a, a full hour here on okay. this this episode of the damn podcast. We're gonna be back on Thursday to do it again for the defensive side of the ball. And that one, that's going to be interesting because I I think there are a lot of new things to talk about on that side of the ball. And that one, I'm just going to say right now, we are going to go an hour. Oh, easily. I really didn't think we were. Carter and I both thought, so I actually started my, my trigger was started because I was going to get it all heated up and ready to go. And now it's going to be real hot. All right. Well, we're going to get out of here and uh, we'll let let all of you listeners that are watching us live on, on YouTube uh, get on with your Sunday evening. We thank you for joining us. Again, you guys are, are helping us crush our numbers right now, both on YouTube and on audio. Uh, if you're having trouble finding us, you know, our, our new audio, um, our, our, you know, our new audio outlet, um, 
reach out to, to one of us on Twitter or, or at Beaver Blitz and, and we'll help you find it. But it should be as simple as just typing in Dan Podcast on your favorite podcast app. We're going to be back on Thursday to talk about the defense. But until then, you can follow me on Twitter at Carter Baines. You can follow her at Angie Machado One. And of course, stick with beaverblitz.com throughout the week for all of our preseason and 2022 football season uh, preview content. Thank you.